Welcome to today's RIMS webinar sponsored by Travelers. Bank fronted surety obligations. I am Justin Smollison, business content manager at RIMS, the Risk and Insurance Management Society. A few notes before we begin. If you have a question for the presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. Feel free to ask at any point in the presentation. We will gather them and the panelists will reply to you directly. Following this session, the recording will be available through the on-demand events page of rims.org. And all downloads and contact information will be accessible to the sponsor. On with today's presentation, we are here to gain an understanding of bank-fronted surety bonds, a form of guarantee frequently used and often required in many business and regulatory situations. Attendees will learn about the features of the product as well as the underwriting approach performed by most surety companies. Our panelists will also explore some common situations when bank-fronted surety bonds are used. And speaking of our panelists, let's introduce them. Gonzalo Videla is a regional underwriting officer at Travelers with 28 years of experience in surety. In addition to his regional underwriting responsibilities, he coordinates the Centers of Excellence and leads the Financial Guarantee COE at Travelers. And we've got Janice Bradley. Janice is an underwriting manager with more than 20 years of underwriting experience. She is considered a subject matter expert on financial guarantees and is excited to provide an overview of bank fronted surety. RIMS is thrilled to welcome a large global audience. Let's begin. Thank you, Justin. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, let's start with a disclaimer. Please take a second to read it. But as a summary, I would say that this presentation is for general information purposes. It refers to coverages generally available in the marketplace and it's not meant to be a recommendation or representation that any particular product or coverage is available or suitable to you or your company's operations. Let's go over our agenda for today's presentation. We are going to very briefly talk about travelers, We'll discuss what bank-fronted surety bonds are and how they work, the application of bank-fronted surety bonds, the advantages of using bank-fronted surety bonds. We will talk about some regulatory restrictions for sureties. We will share with you some examples of bank-fronted surety bonds. And to end, we will go over some of the sureties and banks' considerations. Janice will kick us off with the first few slides. So Janice, please go ahead. Thank you, Gonzalo. As you can see, Travelers has been around for a long time. And with over 100 years in the surety business, and as one of the largest surety writers in the world, we have the expertise to support all of your bonding needs. We have approximately 30,000 employees across the US, Canada, the UK, and Ireland. And we are the only property and casualty company in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. What is a bank-fronted surety bond, or what is sometimes referred to as a back-to-back -back or an indemnity-backed letter of credit? It's a surety structure that includes an additional party, that party being a bank. Essentially, both structures are the same. Let's start with the traditional surety structure. From the illustration, you have the principal, the entity that is required to obtain the bond, to ensure the faithful performance, the surety, the entity that provides the financial guarantee, effectively standing in the place of the principal, and the obligee, the entity that is required, requires the bond from the principal. Effectively, a bank funded surety bond is like a traditional bond, again, except for the addition of a bank. The surety continues to be protected by the indemnity agreement executed by the customer and issues a counter guarantee or bond to the bank, which in turn issues a letter of credit to the obligee. This is reflected in the second illustration. The counter guarantee or reimbursement agreement that is issued to the bank establishes the terms and conditions of the letter of credit, as well as the surety's responsibilities and repayment obligations to the bank in the event of a claim. The obligee or beneficiary of the letter of credit typically 
would not have any knowledge that the insurance carrier is supporting the letter of credit behind the scenes. So it's a seamless situation as far as the customer is concerned. What it secures. This structure can support contract or miscellaneous obligations domestically and internationally, but always within the definition of permissible business and in, in accordance with the applicable regulations. Gonzalo will share more regarding permissible business later in the presentation. Ultimately, the instrument that is issued to the bank is a letter of credit, making the obligation an unconditional pay on demand guarantee. The duration of the obligation is one year with automatic and annual renewals. Those evergreen clauses would now come into play. The language contained in the letter of credit has to be approved and agreed upon by the bank. And if there is no expiry date, the letter of credit may contain what is referred to as pay and walk away language. A non-renewal of the bond will typically trigger a claim or a draw on the letter of credit. And if the bank does draw on the letter of credit, it would most likely be for the maximum penal sum. Okay, just bear with me here. Bank fund maturity is a suitable alternative when there's an appetite to support a permissible obligation. And it can be used to complement a surety bond in fulfillment of a collateral requirement. Examples of when a bank funded surety structure may be applicable is when an obligee will not accept a surety bond or an obligee may limit the amount of collateral they will accept in the form of a surety bond. Um, please note that these restrictions are unlikely to apply with a bank funded surety bond, given the obligee is receiving a letter of credit, allowing the bank funded bond to target up to 100% of the collateral amount. Another example would be if the insurance carrier is not licensed to issue a bond in a certain country and non admitted issuance isn't permitted or when there is not an established fronting partner in the country where the risk is located. These are just some additional things to consider when thinking about opportunities for utilization of this structure. The reason this solution has become so popular is due to the benefits it provides. Starting with the benefits to the customer. It offers the customer more financial flexibility by providing an opportunity to increase liquidity sources or to save money, which is critical in this current economic climate. It may help the customer's economics to switch from using their bank facility. And some letters of credit may be part of a secured bank facility and this would typically be done on an unsecured basis. There may be a cost savings and premiums and fees instead of going directly to the bank for a letter of credit. It removes the limitations of the amount of the surety bond as a percent of collateral, leveraging surety capacity. And it also is a streamlined process, making it easier to obtain guarantees since the surety coordinates the letter of credit execution. So the customer doesn't have to spend time searching for banks, especially if the requirement is for a local bank in a foreign jurisdiction. The benefits to the agent or broker is when other security options are not available or accepted, it provides another solution. 
it satisfies guarantee requirements in countries or jurisdictions where surety bonds are not available. When the obligee limits the amount it would accept in the form of a surety bond, it would allow for higher limits. It helps to solidify and insulate the customer broker relationship or customer agent relationship by providing varied options to satisfy their collateral needs. It also provides a new revenue stream. I'll now pass things over to Gonzalo and he will provide additional insight into permissible obligations. Thank you, Janice. Um, let's talk briefly about some regulatory restrictions that sureties like us are subject to. Some jurisdictions have passed laws and regulations limiting the surety's ability to support financial guarantees. In the US, New York, California, Connecticut, and Florida have laws relative to financial guarantees. Violation of these restrictions can result in fines or penalties and even the revocation of a carrier's insurance license. New York has one of the most restrictive laws about financial guarantees. Under New York law, an insurer that is not a monoline financial guarantee insurer is generally prohibited from writing obligations that fall under the definition of financial guarantee insurance anywhere in the world. This is what's known as the Appleton rule. Permissible business includes obligations defined as fidelity and surety insurance under New York law. More specifically, the law includes as permissible surety business insurance program bonds with a duration of five years or less, guaranteeing the payment of premium, deductibles, and self-insured retentions to an insurer on a worker's compensation or liability policy. With some conditions, New York law also permits supporting lease bonds not exceeding five years in duration for non-residential lease obligations. Internationally, financial guarantees are defined differently in different countries, but generally these definitions are narrower than the definition under New York law. So sureties that are licensed in New York typically look at New York law as the bar for compliance purposes. So why is this relevant for this presentation? Well, the reason is that as part of the underwriting process of a bank-fronted surety bond, sureties must review the underlying obligations to confirm they fall under the definition of permissible surety business under the applicable laws and regulations. So um, let's go over some examples of application of bank fronted surety bonds that we have seen in the market. These are the most common examples, but it's important to know that there may be other applications not mentioned here. In the US, the most common application has been on insurance program bonds, bonds on deductible and paid loss retro or loss sensitive property and casualty insurance programs, Insurance carriers typically require collateral to guarantee the payment of premium, deductibles, and self-insured retentions in these programs. The amount of collateral that can be posted in the form of a surety bond is usually limited to 30 to 40% of the total collateral amount. The difference is required in a form of a letter of credit. So bank-fronted surety bonds are an option to satisfy the letter of credit requirement under these insurance programs. Internationally, we have seen inquiries and requests on service contracts, lease agreements, right of way, money safeguarding, admiralty, and reclamation bonds. When the obligee does not accept a bond or in countries where bonds are not common or not available. You're probably familiar with several of these obligations, but let me cover a couple of them that maybe are less familiar to you. A money safeguarding bond or guarantee is required by the regulations when an entity is collecting money for the benefit of others. A typical example would be a company that offers a payment app. The bond or guarantee protects monies they're holding for the benefit of others in case of a bankruptcy. These bonds are usually required by regulators in Europe and Asia. Admiralty bonds may be required following a collision or accident involving a vessel the bond or guarantee is posted 
to release a vessel or other property and to secure the third party's legal claim against the vessel. In an essence, admiralty bonds are similar to court bonds, but filed in a maritime court or concerning maritime law. Surety bonds are generally very common and available in the Americas and to some extent in parts of Europe. However, bank guarantees are more prevalent in Europe, in the Middle East and Asia. So the bank fronted surety bond opportunities that we have seen so far have been mostly in these regions. So let's talk about what sureties typically look for. The sureties underwriting considerations for bank fronted surety bonds focus on the same areas and with this, as with other high risk uh, surety obligations. Sureties look for a solid financial position and strong capital structure, good quality and stable profits. Given the nature of these transactions, there is a special focus on a company's liquidity and cash flow generation capacity. Generally, the target market for these transactions are investment grade type companies with high speculative grade ratings considered on a case by case basis. From an operational standpoint, sureties focus on a stable industries not subject to high volatility or cyclicality, a company size, scope, and position in the market, the quality of its management's experience and track record, as well as the company's track record and reputation. Other important considerations include transparency, information flow, access to information and to management. Also, as a surety, we're interested in maintaining a surety program with a healthy balance of high risk and lower risk obligations. One last but very important item, as we mentioned in prior slides, is the compliance review of the underlying obligation from the standpoint of applicable laws and regulations. From the bank's perspective, the bank assesses the surety company's financial position and credit rating since the surety is the bank's counterparty. The bank extends capacity and offers terms and conditions based on their assessment of the surety. And the surety and the bank enter into a reimbursement agreement and or a counter guarantee or bond to guarantee the surety's obligation to the bank. The bank also reviews and assesses the underlying obligation and approves the required letter of credit wording. It is important to note that banks typically only accept unconditional wordings and prefer annual instruments with an evergreen provision. Lastly, the bank also performs their know your customer process on the surety's client who is the applicant on the letter of credit, and it follows its environmental, social, and governance policies. To end and summarizing our presentation today, bank fronted surety bonds can help you and your client reduce the use of the bank line to secure letters of credit. So if you have collateralized agreements or a law sensitive insurance program, or are required to post guarantees in foreign countries where traditional surety bonds are not available or accepted, there may be an opportunity for you to use bank fronted surety bonds as an option. If you have needs like this, um, contact your surety broker or your surety underwriter to learn more about bank fronted surety bonds. Thank you. Justin, I turn it back to you for the uh, Q&A portion of the uh, presentation. All right. Well, we've got some questions and everybody can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes. Oh, okay, great. All right, here we go. So what are we seeing as the best opportunities in the bank fronted space? Um, thank you. That, that's, that's a good question. Um, as indicated in my remarks, uh, in the US, the majority of the transactions that we have seen are related to insurance programs. We have seen the most success in the lower range of the investment grade and high range of the spec grade ratings. So from double B, double B plus to triple B, triple, triple B plus, 
is where we've seen most of the, the success. Um, and the reason being that it seems that that's where there's a good balance between the risk appetite that a surety may have and also being able to provide uh, competitive pricing. Internationally, um, I guess the opportunities that we have seen have been more in regions where bonds are not commonly accepted and available. So as I said in my remarks, in the Americas, bonds are transacted um, fairly commonly. Um, but as you move east uh, and you go to Europe, and especially in Southeast Asia, bank guarantees are more common. So the majority of the opportunities we've seen have been mainly in Southeast Asia. Okay, great. I've got another one. What is the most important thing to keep in mind when working on a bank-fronted deal? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, there are a few steps to consider from a customer's perspective. Um, Bank-funded bonds represent an opportunity to free up liquidity sources or to save money relative to the cost of their existing letter of credit facility. So understanding what the true driver is, is it freeing up availability under their credit facility or is it pricing um, will help to guide that discussion with your surety market. Okay. Gonzalo, would you say that you agree there? I do agree with that. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, can a bank-fronted surety bond be issued along with a surety bond, or do they compete or replace one another? Janice, do, do you want to take this, or do you want me to? You can go ahead. Okay. So so that's another good question. Um, the, the short answer is yes, uh, especially in the case of insurance programs, as we, we mentioned. Uh, of the total collateral amount required by the insurance carrier, uh, there's a portion that can be satisfied and, and posted um, with a surety bond. And then the difference is a letter of credit. So particularly in those situations, um, we have seen with frequency um, that a surety bond is written for say 25, 30% of the collateral uh, required and the other, um, is 75 or 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 70 percent is satisfied with a bank fronted surety bond so we've seen several of those uh situations uh so it's 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 common fantastic uh i didn't i didn't cut anybody off there did i nope nope okay no would bank fronted surety bonds be accessible to building developers who currently need locs as securities in development agreements with municipalities or is the product more for larger corporations? Um, another great question. Um, what we have seen so far has been mainly driven by larger corporations, um, but not exclusively. Um, as, as, as I mentioned in some of the slides, there are certain things that juries would look for uh, in terms of the quality of the credit, the quality of the information received, um, the frequency uh, and access to information, the transparency. Um, so all those factors um, would be taken into account. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's not available to developers, but I'd say, you know, we would look at good, solid credits where we have good access to um information and access to management uh, to get comfortable with these type of uh, structures. All right, uh, I got another question from the audience for you. What if the banking facility in use by the client does not have international capabilities? C can you repeat that question, Justin? What sure. if Sure. What if the banking facility in use by the client or the client's bank does not have international capabilities? So, so in those situations, I think bank fronted surety bonds are especially helpful in those situations. And the reason I, I say that is the bank facility that is used is the surety's bank banking relationship. So if the surety's banking relationship has present in that particular country or, or, or foreign jurisdiction, 
um, then the client doesn't have to try to find a bank who has a local presence in that country. Um, so specifically for, for those reasons is that we mentioned that the process itself is streamlined for for the client um, because they don't they don't have to deal with trying to put in place uh, a, those facilities uh, with a with a foreign bank. Uh, the sureties may have relationships with global banks that that have presence in a particular country where the letter of credit is needed. Okay. Yeah, we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience. We're just kind of sifting through it. Uh, I've got another good one for you. Are there any references to the surety carrier on the letter of credit or LOC? Or is it totally clean and only references the bank issuing the LOC? Chinese, you want to? Sure. So it would be totally clean. It would just be between the, the client and the bank. The counter guarantee is between the insurance company and the bank. So the letter of credit would be clean as far as the customer was concerned. Okay. And on that same topic, does the surety carrier select the bank that issues the LC, the LOC? So the relationship between the bank and the insurance company, um, it's a relationship that they have between themselves. So yes, the surety um, is selecting the, the banks that we're working with. We work with several banks. Okay, great. We got some more coming in here. Just bear with us for just a moment as we get some new ones. Um, folks, let me just remind you, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Uh, okay, so does travelers have existing banking relationships to use when dealing with these sorts of scenarios? Yes, uh, we do. We in fact have uh, several banks that we have relationship with um, and no different than maybe, you know, sureties. Um, banks have different footprints. They have different appetites. Um, they have different, I guess, strengths uh, in what they can do. So we do have a full uh, uh, suit of banks, um, and depending on the on the type of obligation, depending on where the letter of credit is needed, um, we choose to use one bank or another. Um, so, so yes, we do have uh, several uh, relationships currently. Excellent, and uh, we're just sifting through some more. Uh, is it usually a harmonious relationship? Um, I, I guess it refers to the surety <laughs> between the surety and the bank. Good. So, so if that's the question, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we we do have um, a very good, very close relationships uh, with with the bank. So, knock on wood, but you know, so far it's been a great great relationship. Okay. Uh, do you see? this product trickling down to the middle market for clients with strong balance sheets, but who also may have smaller letter of credit outlays. Um, Janice, you want me to take this or? Sure, you, you can take that. No. Okay, so, um, so the answer is uh, yes. Um, from, from our standpoint, the there are a few things that we look at and I'm sort of repeating myself, but okay. for us, it's very important um, to be comfortable with the particular credits. So, so the particular client um, and access to information, access to management, you know, all those things that we mentioned during the presentation. Um, so as long as that is, um, we can check that box, sort of speak. Um, then the um, the product can be available to you know middle middle market you know accounts. Um, so um, I think that's that that for us is the the most important thing. The other thing that I wanted to mention was, you know, it's important for us to keep a balance of uh, in the surety program, um, and I mentioned that too. We want to have a you know a balance between higher risk 
uh, obligations like these ones uh, and lower risk obligations. So I think in, in the way the question was asked, uh, the fact that it may be a smaller need uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't have an interest. The, the only exception to that is if the need is too small, um, maybe, maybe there's, no, there's no appetite for it simply because when you look at the structure of these products, there are a lot of people involved, a lot of entities and a lot of coordination, a lot of documentation that goes be, uh, behind the scenes. So there's got to be a, a trade-off between you know the the effort and and the and the benefit, if you will, uh, of of putting one of these together. So if it's too small, probably not. But if it's uh, a, a smaller size, uh, it can be considered. Okay, got another one. Two part question for you: What would happen if the bank decided to non renew per the Evergreen provisions? Would this cause a default? Yes. The short answer is yes. If the bank does not renew the letter of credit and the letter of credit is not replaced, just like any other letter of credit, the beneficiary would claim on that letter of credit. Uh, they would claim on the surety's uh, counter guarantee and the surety will seek to get reimbursed uh, from the client. Okay. Uh, going through some more here. Uh, give us a moment, folks. Keep putting your questions in the box here, folks. You're doing great. Uh, we're having a really great dialogue here. You're getting direct insight from two leaders in this space. Um, let's see what's coming in next that we can take. Okay. Um, is it okay for me to ask questions about uh, particular countries? Sure. Okay. What is the best process to get overview information for a particular country? And uh, let's just start with that. Um, that's that's a, a good question. It's it's kind of broad and I'm not sure what context uh, was used to to ask the question mm -hmm. um, because the, the overview would be on the the country itself um, like the the country's economy or 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 something to that effect I, I'm not sure how to answer the question um, so if whomever asked that question if they could kind of clarify okay all right, so let's so let's say uh, the, the follow up to that was what's what is reasonable and customary in Singapore, for example, as opposed to Western Europe or the United States. So so Singapore traditionally has been more of a bank guarantee market. There are a few surety bonds that have been written there, but usually they look and and behave very similar to a bank guarantee or a letter of credit. Um, so if that's the question, um, in, in Singapore, um, bank-fronted surety bonds um, would be, you know, applicable uh, from that standpoint. Okay. Trying to find, a, I think I found another good one. I'm just waiting to get a thumbs up. Nope. Uh, give that another moment. Keep putting your questions in the box, folks. We are getting to as many as we can. All right. Gonzalo, tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, while we're waiting for the next question, tell us a little bit about the centers of excellence that you lead. So um, Travelers has... Um, 15 teams that focused on particular market niches or industries or particular uh, surety products. Um, these teams are comprised of uh, underwriters, uh, both in our field office uh, structure and home office. 
Uh, we have claims people, we have legal support, um, and the teams basically focused on understanding the particular niche or, or product, uh, and developing an underwriting strategy around it, um, and educating the rest of the organization uh, around that product or niche. Um, we started with that several years ago and you know we started one or two uh, teams and we're up to uh, 15 now um, and we have over a hundred people involved in in different teams um, so uh, so it's something that works very very well for us and you know provides us a a, a platform to to learn and educate our underwriting teams on particular uh, particular products or or niches, as I mentioned, industries, as I mentioned. Okay, excellent. Fifteen centers. Fifteen that, one five. Yep. Wow. Okay, that's a pretty big achievement. Uh, is there any success with this product using a domestic bank or foreign only? This is the first of a multi part question. So. Um, we we do have relationship uh, with both. Um, we do have relationships with uh, um, some foreign banks, but we also have relationships with uh, local banks that are uh, based uh, primarily outside of uh, out of New York. So, yes, both. Okay, and then I'm going to do the the follow up there. the The participant is curious on a discussion of. The risk, if a bank decides overall that this business is a uh, bank fronted surety business is no longer a business they want to be in and gets, and gets, I guess, rid of all LOCs with counter guarantees, um, is that, I'll, I'll re, I'll re ask that question. Is, <laughs> Thank is you. It, <laughs> have you ever been in a situation where a bank decides that the bank fronted surety bond business is no longer a business they want to be in? and then gets rid of all LOCs with counter guarantees. No, we have not been in that situation. And I think that would be a very, very difficult um, thing to do um, for a bank, at least the ones that we, we work with. Okay. And what is the largest percentage of an LOC that can be replaced with a surety bond? So... Um, I, I think the question refers to a bank fronted surety bond. Okay. So if, if that's the case, then the answer would be up to 100% of that letter of credit, depending on the surety's appetite and depending on, you know, who the client is and capacity needed, et cetera, but it can be up to 100%. Wow. Okay. And how does a surety backed LOC provide a cost advantage over an ILOC under the client's credit facility? So, you know, um, we're not representing or saying that it does in every single case, but we have seen situations where it does. Um, and, and the reason for that is that there's a surety involved that is guaranteeing the bank. Um, and as long as the bank is comfortable with that surety and their financial position, credit rating, and the underlying documentation between the two, uh, it is possible that the surety gets a better pricing than the client going direct to their bank. Okay. And with a bank-fronted surety, what is the level of exposure and risk to the bank? What is the level? Can you repeat that, Justin? Sure. Sorry. Sure. Uh, with a bank fronted surety, what is the level of exposure and risk to the bank? I I I think it's the same. Um, so, from a client's perspective, the the exposure and the risk would be the same as the client going directly to their bank and getting a letter of credit directly from the bank because the underlying obligation and the amount 
presumably are the same. So the exposure and the risk would be the same. All right, we're going through some more here. Um, just give us a moment, folks. Keep putting those questions in the question box and um, we will get to it. Janice, you're a subject matter expert on financial guarantees. Do you ever do guest columns and publications and things like that? No, I have never done that. No? Oh, okay. No. I was hoping that you were going to say, uh, well, yes, I used to do that all the time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, when you joined the underwriting and you joined as an underwriter, was that something you had always wanted to do or you sort of fell into it? Um. Surety um, underwriting is relatively new to me. I've been doing it for just about almost 10 years now, oh. but um, I also have underwriting experience on the PNC and group life side of the, of the house. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. I think we're just making sure that some of the questions are up to snuff here. So keep putting your questions in there, folks, and we're going to get to as many more as we can. Just a reminder that there will be a copy of this video on the on-demand events page of rims.org very soon. The on-demand events page also has other webinars that we've done. You will also find a previous traveler session in there from this year. It's called Your Greatest Asset, Smart Risk Management in the Age of Workforce Transformation. That was held on June 28th. That was a great one. So you will see that there. You're in good company. Um, Let's see if we've got anything else that we can use here, or maybe I'll wait for the boss to tell me if it's time to pick it up. All right. I think we're going to, we're going to get ready to close out for now. So I would like to thank Gonzalo Videla and Janice Bradley for, from Travelers for their time and expertise. Um, today's session will be available on the on-demand events page of rims.org very soon. And so look for that probably by Monday. Um, we will remember, it, we have all your questions and we will gather them. Panelists will reply to you directly if we didn't get a chance to get to them today. Uh, be sure to check out RIMSCast. That is the Society's official free and weekly podcast that is hosted by yours truly. Visit rims.org slash rimscast to hear all 206 episodes. The RIMS ERM conference 2022 will be held live and in person in Indianapolis on in, on November 11th and 12th, we want to see you there. So view the agenda, register at rims.org slash ERM2022 and new registrations will receive an additional discount by typing the code RIMSCAST2022 in the payment page before checkout. Finally, RIMS is global and we'd love for you to build your network with us. Visit rims.org slash membership and apply. Thank you all. This was a great session. Stay safe. <laughs>